the strength of our democracy starts in the classrooms um, where students um, learn how to engage with one another, confront history, um, build consensus around issues, learn how to disagree and, um, you know, just learn the issues around them for the first time outside of their home, um, kind of on their own terms. Um, but we also have seen that, you know, civics education is under a coordinated assault right now. Um, in that in over 30 states, there have been hundreds of bills restricting what history and civics education can be taught in the classroom. And it's compounding a larger crisis in civics education and that lower income underserved students are less proficient in civics, are less trusting of their government officials and are less likely to therefore participate in the political process. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of our Fall 2022 Spring 2023 Virtual Lecture Series, Our Issues, Our Voices, Our Votes, Youth Civic Participation Today, a survey course for all. This afternoon's program is entitled Youth Civic Participation, More Than Just Voting. Historically, one of the groups of voters who do not turn out are young people. This holds true across partisan, regional, religious, and other differences. In today's discussion, we examine the reasons why there is low voter turnout and consider other forms of participation. How do millennials and Gen Zers see their civic role in their communities? How are they reimagining and reshaping what it means to be involved and engaged? This series is a collaboration among Suffolk University's Political Science and Legal Studies Department, GBH Forum Network, the Washington Center, and Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. I'd like to thank the Lowell Institute for their generous funding, which makes programs like this possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Christina Coolidge, who is a faculty member in the Political Science and Legal Studies Department here at Suffolk University. Christina? Thank you, Susan, and welcome to everyone. I am very, very excited to be here, and it is a really, really nice coincidence that this panel is taking place during National Voter Registration Week, so I want to give a shout out to all the work that's being done by our Suffolk Votes organization, members of whom are with us tonight. So I would be remiss if I didn't say if there's anybody out there who is not registered to vote or doesn't have a plan to vote, please do and do it soon. Tonight's panel is, or this afternoon's panel is about more than just Voting. Voting is important. We know voting is important. Elections matter. Numbers matter. But the question is, are younger folks getting a bad rap? We know that they're not turning out the same numbers as older folks to vote. But what else are they doing? We know they're active in their communities. We know they're active on issues that they care about. So we want to really explore all facets of this. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists and toss to Katie. We have Milo Gringlis from Generation Citizen, Mia Payne, uh, Saida Rahman from Suffolk University. And Saida, we butchered your name on the slide. I'm very sorry. Uh, Nancy Thomas from Tufts and our moderator, Katie Lanahan from GBH News. So welcome everybody, Katie, take it away. Thanks, Christina, and thanks to our four panelists and for everyone who's tuned in to chat with us this afternoon. I'm really excited to be having this conversation as we uh, head pretty solidly into election season here. It's a good time to be having this discussion. And I'm really hoping maybe Nancy, you can help set the stage for us here and tell us a little bit from, from your work, what you see the landscape of youth civic participation looks like right now. All right, 
Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Thomas, and I'm very delighted to be here. Uh, so here's what I see. I see a big group. I see a fired up group. And I see a powerful group. And we don't need to empower them. They already are. The question is, what, what great things are we going to see? I also see a group that is thinking about political engagement in a lot of different ways. So, for example, voting is very fundamental and clearly something we should all do. And I hope that is what happens. But activism is the number one thing that young people are doing right now, issue activism. They care about issues. They care about each other. And they are going to let their voices be heard. That's what I see. Excellent. And our, our other panelists are all pretty actively engaged themselves. And I'd love to ask each of you to, to kind of introduce yourself by giving your civic engagement origin story. What motivated you to get involved and how? Uh, maybe Saida, we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you so much, Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, a little bit about myself. Currently, I'm working with Suffolk Votes as a Suffolk Votes scholar, I'm leading the Suffolk Votes program, which is a nonpartisan um, organization that you know aims to register students to vote, but also to get students civically engaged in their community. I'm also working at Archipelago Strategies Group as a community engagement coordinator, where I create field plans and um, execute them um, for a lot of different organizations like Department of Public Health and um, other private organizations. So um, how did I kind of get started? Well, I would say that the first thing that really got me thinking that I want to work in policy, I want to work in civic engagement was when I started working at Girls Inc. as a um, teen health ambassador where I taught sex ed to middle school and high school kids. Um, and I did this uh, during my sophomore year in high school. Um, and from there, we ended up um, organizing a group of people, a group of students to go to the school council and change policy to allow um, contraceptives into the schools, which was not being allowed before, even though we had a teen health center where, you know, students could go and learn about um, contraceptives, but they couldn't get them. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that um, we were allowing them into the health classes, into the teen health center, because Lynn had a really high pregnancy rate. And going and speaking to the school council and uh you know being able to change their mind on the spot really uh you know lit a fire under me and made me think i want to go change more things so i continued on my path and um continued with of course voter engagement but also a lot of civic engagement issues excellent uh, mia maybe we hear from you next how and when did you decide to engage Hi, my name is Mia Payne. I'm a representative of YVOTE. I joined the program. I joined YVOTE in June of 2022, I believe, um, the summer of 2020, the summer of 2020, exactly, yes. And so basically what was happening during that time, there was a lot of racial tensions in America and I was very interested in what I can do as a young person. And so when I would go on social media and hear all these conversations about everything that was going on during that time, the biggest thing that I heard was we have to vote. This is a reason why we should vote. And it was highlighting a lot of voting, but I did not understand exactly what that meant. And so I wasn't clear as to how voting actually related to addressing issues because I never saw that direct connection. And so why vote was just a platform that's saying like, what's the issue that you care about? We want to we want to address you from an issue based perspective because that's where we're going to get your passion at. And so I joined from I joined into criminal justice. We have different action groups. And so what we do is we basically invite youth into the conversation of civics through their uh, issues that they're most passionate about, whether that be climate justice or criminal justice or health justice whatever the, the justice that they're looking for in a specific area, we invite them in and we tell them, okay, now you have a civic duty to fulfill. And we want you to understand that and learn that through the lens of what you're passionate about. And the civic duty was the first time I ever heard the term um, in Wivo. And I think the reason I felt so involved is because I'm learning about issues and I want to understand what the power I need to actually address them. And so I wasn't exactly interested in politics or policy because I think a lot of times with politics, it's like there's a lack of urgency and a lack of political bravery that we see within our politicians but within these youth conversations it's just civil civic discourse and basically just addressing how we get to the root of these issues and addressing that rather than the whole hot landscape of how politics looks and just getting the right image is more so about getting sure that there's justice for communities 
Excellent. Thank you. And Milo, let's hear from you. Hi, thank you so much, Katie. And thank you to Suffolk University Political Science Department for having me. Um, I was definitely fortunate to be raised in a very politically active and conscious family, which informed a lot of my views as a child. Um, and I really wanted to see it up close. Um, in high school, I was a Senate page. Um, so I got a very front row seat to uh, the seat of government um, and saw kind of political action take place right in front of me. But I also noticed the kind of dysfunction and stagnancy um, that took place at the highest levels of government. Um, and at Cornell, I really wanted to find an outlet for more direct community action, community engagement, especially on youth issues. And when I looked around me, I saw that there was skyrocketing rates of youth addiction to nicotine. Um, and alongside two of my very close friends at Cornell, um, I was a, a legislative advocate for our student-led nonprofit called Students Against Nicotine. Um, and we advocated for a common self common sense public health measures at local, state, and federal levels of government. And what we saw is that, you know, our, our voices as youth, as, as kids, was actually very powerful. And lawmakers were engaging with us and listening to our stories. Um, and we were kind of um, making intergenerational bonds between um, older advocates and older elected officials in the process. Um, and that was super important and it opened a lot of new doors for me. Um, and then I kind of took this work after I graduated um, with me to Generation Citizen. And what we do is we engage nearly 30,000 uh, middle and high school students um, across the United States to develop civic action pro projects related to problems they see in their communities and then connect them with legislative officials um, public officials, um, local county executives to listen to their ideas um, and kind of bring youth voices into local and state policy making and advocacy. Great. Um, and Milo, you mentioned the idea of intergenerational bonds. And I think that's an interesting point here because so many of these issues that you're talking about, the three of you, are things that really affect all age ranges, though, you know, young people in particular are passionate about them. Mia, Saida, I'm, I'm curious from you, what kind of reaction in your advocacy are you getting from older folks from different generations? Are they are they telling you to sit back and wait your turn? Are they welcoming you into the process? And, and what kind of support would you like to see from other voter or other generations here? Yeah, um, I can start. Uh, I personally have been extremely lucky to have amazing mentors in my life who have not told me to wait my turn, who have pushed me um, through the glass ceilings and on the barriers. Um, so, um, you know, I think I've been very lucky. I don't think that everyone is. Um, so I do think there are a lot of people um, in power um, who aren't creating avenues for young people to get civically engaged and to have a real impact. Um, as, as you said, so many young people are, you know, the ones that are creating these movements, you know, starting these grassroots organizations and really at the forefront, but they're not being able to make change. Um, and I think what needs to happen is more people um, who are in positions of power, whether it be teachers, you know, directors, CEOs, um, politicians, need to give young people platforms. Um, and I think the big reason that I was able to have a platform and really be able to make any sort of change is because um, I was able to work with people who are much older than me, who are much more experienced, who opened the door and were like, here, Saida, take this platform, you go and you, um, you know, make this change. And I think more people um, need to work with young people who they see as, you know, um, advocating and who are um, fighting for their causes to hold them up and give them a platform. Yes, and just to add on to that incredible response, I think the work that we do doesn't exist without our adult allies. Um, intergenerational conversation is so um, it's so critical to the conversation that we have as, uh, as youth around civic engagement, because mind you, we're coming in and we want to learn. And so we need someone to pour into us. We need someone to give us that information our, and their experiences. And also it prevents us from dealing with challenges that we may not have to deal with if we already know and we're already equipped on how to face it because someone else has already done it for us. And so it's about passing that generational um, experience and passing that generational wisdom and acknowledging that we've lacked in our responsibilities and our contributions to society and to what to continue to uphold and 
and we continue to uphold social inequality. So I think when we need to seek justice for those who have been unfairly treated and have been experiencing through like a corrupt system um, of government that we need to understand that intergenerational dialogue is the future of civic engagement because without it, our social political landscape this kind of looks kind of um, more so, not even more so biased, but more so um, lack of lack of wisdom and lack of education behind of what we know. And I think there's lack of action too, because we need those resources and opportunities and we can't be presented with that without someone that's already been through the path that we're going in. Nancy, I, I see you nodding there. What, what do you see as the, the role here for, for other generations? Yeah, so, um, so I'm at the Institute of for democracy and higher education over at Tufts University's Tisch College. And we study all things political on college campuses. We launched this study back in 2013 and gave campuses their data for 2014 very early on. And at that point, believe it or not, of undergraduate uh, students, the average voting rate was 13%. So it might have been very easy to say, oh, shame on you all, you're not voting. That wasn't the problem. The problem was there wasn't the institutional commitment but behind student engagement that empowered, that broke down barriers to voting, that educated students on the mechanics of voting, and that provided them with opportunities to talk about the issues that they care about so that they could then get involved in ways that were more meaningful to them as individuals. So I always saw my role as holding up a mirror to higher education as a mechanism for giving voice to your generation. I I never claimed to know exactly how to, how to mobilize you all. That, that was my job. I'm going to mobilize you. Well, that's, that's not my job. You, you mobilize perfectly well without me. What I needed to do is talk with college and university administrators and professors and so forth and say, get out of their way, enable them, provide them with the opportunities and structures that they need. And boy, oh boy, did you step up. Just to be very clear, voting rates in the United States in 2020, the last presidential election, were an average of 67 percent and college students voted at 66 percent. So um, non-college youth lag behind, but they're definitely they're definitely catching up. And I think as a collective effort, that's got to be part of what we're working on next. Great. And let's. Take a take a look maybe outside of college too. If we took it, talk about high schoolers and younger teens who who aren't maybe old enough to vote yet, um, who might not see a way into the the political and the civic process. Um, does anyone have thoughts? I'll throw it out to all of you on on how to reach that population on how how they can get involved as well. I just wanted to um, first before answering that question, I want to quickly add on to what Nancy was saying before about like intergenerational support. And I think it's important that we understand that we don't just need um, the older generation to come behind us, but we also need them to go before us and stand beside us and make sure that they're leading us in the right direction. And they're always there, like in case that we need we need support. We don't know which direction to go, that we have that wisdom and we have that mentorship. Um, but for reaching the younger generation, I was 16 when I started um, getting engaged in civics and I didn't know a thing about civic engagement. All I knew was was that there was injustices going around and I wanted to know what I could do to contribute to um to equality. And so I think we have to understand that young people are coming in with a very like basic vision of I want to see a better world. And so I think sometimes we get so caught up in the complexity of our systems that we start to think like, oh, well, we have to go through this and you have to learn this. And it's like, no, like listen to the vision of young people. And that's how we're going to get them engaged. Bring in our politicians, have them engaged within our communities because there's a lack of relationship, which is why there's also a lack of civic engagement. I have like I did not meet my first elected official until I was 17. And that's because I invited them into an event. They never they never had community outreach events. There was never spaces for me to actually contribute my um, perspective and my issues in my community to someone that was in a position of power. And so we have to first start by establishing that relationship and making sure that young people and their visions are heard, because a lot of the times they have the answers that we spend years searching for, that we go to college searching for, that we think we need degrees and all these people in positions of power when all we really need is the mind of a young person who wants to see equity for their future generation. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Um, yeah, that's an excellent response. And I think 
that voting is just one tool in the civic toolbox that we have. And we think ultimately that that's the extent of it. I, I think there's historically low trust of government. There's a ton of cynicism and people, especially kids, see futility in, in the process of the democratic process. Um, but I, I think that we need to be working with kids and connecting them to legislative officials, getting them in rooms um, before, you know, they go off and they're adults. Um, like Mia said, she was 17 when she met her first elected official. Um, at Generation Citizen, we're working to connect middle and high schoolers to elected officials to, you know, get them to engage in a dialogue, um, a two-way street, not just one talking to the other, um, and show them that, like, government actually works for them. Their council members, their elected officials work for them. And they are like kids uh, are living in the same complex world as adults where there's gun violence and there's drug abuse and there's homelessness and poverty and that they're entitled to see, you know, equitable outcomes and representation as well. Yeah, I totally agree with um, both of you guys. 100% um, Suffolk Woods is also working to make politicians accessible to young people. Um, and I think that's something that should start in high school. Um, I mean, I think it's a shame that, you know, Mia met her first politician when she was 17. Um, you know, you should be knowing who your politicians are and seeing them in community events from a very young age, I would say even elementary school. Because if you're not being taught this when as you're growing up, you don't think it's important. That's why people don't turn out to vote because they don't know that this is supposed to be important. They don't know what change this can create. Um, and, and I think the biggest thing that I did, and I think with my work with Girls Inc, um, was definitely connecting um, something that, you know, the high school kids and middle school kids cared about um, to the process of politics, you know, to going to city council or um, getting out the vote and issues like that. Um, you have to be able to connect what young people care about. Um, to politics and politicians need to also address these issues that young people care about and one of the bigger reasons that they don't is because young people don't um, turn out to vote and that's because of these barriers that are in place so at civic education needs to start at a very young age and needs to continue throughout and it needs to be just as important as math and science and everything else so we've talked a bit about the idea of kind of feeling disconnected from the government of, you know, I think we've, I've heard about a, a lack of urgency from politicians or a sense of dysfunction. I, how do you overcome that feeling, uh, particularly with a young person who, who might look at the massive challenges they see, things like climate change, income inequality, and how do you keep from becoming cynical and just tuning it out and saying, I'm not even going to bother with this. They don't want to hear from me. I think that's a, actually the perspective that a lot of youth take on when they don't vote is that they're just kind of overwhelmed by everything that's going on. But I think that's why it's so important that we express and raise awareness around civic education, because I feel like civic duty is defined by preparing ourselves to step into these positions that we're one, that we're one day going to have to fulfill, which is another reason why intergenerational relation is so crucial to youth participation, um, because we need those experiences and we need to understand that, listen, yes, we do come in and we are a generation facing a challenge that no other generation has faced, especially coming with climate change. Um, but I think I'm very confident in the resilience of Gen Z. And I don't think that we're just going to fall into to, like giving up, I think we're also go we're going to understand that. Listen, we not just a generation that has the most um, challenging global issue ever, but we're also a generation that has more resources than ever. We are the most like ethnically diverse generation, and I think we can take hold and like take use of all the power that we hold as a generation, not even just being ethnically diverse, but having all the resources at our hand as far as technology, as far as education. And that's why we want to see equity in these systems, because we know that all of these contribute to to this bigger issue that we do have to face, which is climate change as a generation. Um, but I think we're so equipped that we just need to fight for people to stand with us. It's not a matter of, are we going to do it? Or are we going to face a challenge? We're up to face any challenge and any battle that this generation um, has to face, but it's just a matter of, are you gonna give me the resources and tools to actually be equipped to face it? Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, sorry, I'm thinking back to what Nancy said at the outset of this call. She said, we don't need to empower kids. We don't need to empower youth. We just need to show them that they have power. 
um, and that they can utilize it. And I think something we need to see is more young people in spaces of power um, and positions of power, whether that's super local where, you know, you can achieve tangible action outcomes on like school boards or student government, um, as well as, you know, county executive offices. Um, Less than 5% of all elected officials are in their 20s. Um, And I think that's something that we need to change. We need to champion um, young politicians, young change makers, and elevate and amplify their voices um, where they can actually have policy impacts. Well, and just to follow up on what Milo just said, first of all, to give credit where credit is due, somebody said that in the call that we used to prepare for this, this show and said exactly it's not empowering students showing them that they have power or that they already have power. And I just thought it was such a, a brilliant comment. I'm quoting one of you from last week, but I, w- I will say that we also have to be pretty clear eyed ag- about the barriers that are facing this young generation. And I think one of the big ones is the reluctance on the part of elected officials and people in my generation to actually yield power. And we we have to be we have to be clear-eyed about that. The other thing is that I think that democracy has never worked for everybody in this country. It and so one thing that we need to start talking about is the democracy we want, not the one we have. And I think it's it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to lose faith in systems because they don't work for everybody. But if we're all working together to get those systems to work for everybody, then I think it's a more inspiring vision and something a little more motivating. Uh, but we definitely need to be clear about some of the suppressive tactics that are going on around the country to disempower people, particularly people of color. Um, and the backsliding that is going on around the democratic gains that we've had in the last hundred years. And as we talk about kind of the idea of, you know, making space for students to to use their power and access that, um, and the idea of older generations uh, bringing in students into the process. Saida, I'm curious how you, talk to your peers about this, how you work at a, at a college level to increase engagement among college students. What's your, what's your pitch for why your people, you know, should get involved? My pitch is that if you get involved, you accomplish something, even if it's the smallest ever, you will accomplish something, you will get something out of this experience. Um, And what I always tell people is like, you don't know until you ask, right? Like, you don't know if you can get this job, if you can get this opportunity, until you ask, until you do something about it. Um, And the biggest thing is, you know, college students are at the forefront of so many of these movements. Um, I mean, you know, tuition, college tuition. Everyone is upset about how high tuition is and how much tuition they have to pay and how much student debt they have to go to. I use that as an example all the time. You care about this? Advocate for this. You will see a change. And we recently did see some debt relief, right? So clearly it's working. And I try to point to movements that students have started that have been successful, that have gained media attention to help students see that they do have power. Um, And I think I also just try to use myself as an example and try to use my peers who are involved just on campus at smaller levels as examples because it's really helpful when you see people who look like them who sound like them who have the same ideas as them in positions of power who are making a difference because i think that's what it is it's about upholding these people you know i didn't grow up seeing a lot of young people who were you know working in politics who were running campaigns who were designing campaigns and i had to really fight my way through it but i think the younger generation now has the opportunity to see more young people in these positions of power. I mean, look at the amazing panelists we have um, with us, you know, who are making great differences in their communities. So I think we have to keep upholding people um, who are making a difference and using them as an example to push other folks forward. Great. And and Mia, what kind of conversations do you have with your peers about maybe getting involved and, and overcoming some of the barriers they face as youth? 
Yeah, similar um, to Saida. We we basically just have conversations about, listen, you have an issue you care about, get into civics um, because it's kind of like a direct co correlation. But I think we also want you to understand civics is more than voting because a lot of the times when you try to get into civic engagement, they're like, oh, I'm going to worry about that when I'm 18, when I, when I can actually do something. We're like, no, you can do something now if I partner you with this person or if I just get you interested in this, in, in this event and stuff like that. And so just making sure that youth are getting involved and engaged, it's really important that we engage engage youth from a community base first before we get them into 18 and then they're just like voting and they have no actual relation but they have all this power of just don't know how to use it so it's important that like if you're interested at like 10 or like 14 or 16 just come in and start with community engagement that's really going to give you the mindset that you need to go into um, these spaces. And I think another thing is when we talk about youth voting barriers, I feel like voter suppression is an extremely strategic approach to strip away um, the power from young generation, not only the younger generation, but low income and communities of color. And the practices of voter suppression today like are a perfect example of why we have to move beyond policy and engage in community. It's not that people of color or young people don't have the right to vote. We just don't have the tools and resources to exercise that right. So civic education is like the key to unlocking all the power that you have over your systems of government. Um, because like, like we said before, like we can sometimes get into the complexity of the system that fools us into thinking that the system is bigger than us, when really I feel like an educated and wise mind will always carry more influence and authority than like a thousand policies combined. And so I believe it's all about the way that you go about your work, making sure your motives are purely for the people that you serve and stepping into positions of leadership with a sensitive ear and like a strong will. Great. And and Milo, I'm curious too, you know, Mia talked about get civic involvement early and how do you go about trying to, to foster that sense of civ civic action with people? Sure. Yeah, I, I would say I say think local, right? We hear all politics is local, but it, it's true. I think the thought of, you know, getting into the political process and we think of the federal government, right? It's this huge um, system of institutions that is seemingly untouchable and that doesn't actually work for the American people. Well, our local offices um, of elected official, of executives, of policymakers, um, that's where the real change you can, that's where the real change that you can see happens. Um, so with the students that we work with, we urge them to really find a, a community issue right at home, um, that they're, they can closely relate to and that they have the resources and tools to actually, uh, pursue a change. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's easy to see you know, civic action as this daunting thing, because when we think about it, we think of like all of the national government. But when we begin to localize our politics and our practices and our, our community organizing efforts, I think that's that's where, you know, we create stronger networks um, and that only grows outward and outward. Great. So when we're when we're seeing people starting to get involved for the first time, uh, maybe as a young person or these, you know, voter turnout numbers that we've seen from these younger generations, how do you sustain it? How do you make sure it's not a blip, a, a one time thing? How do you, you keep that energy there um, for whoever wants to jump in? Um. The way to sustain it is continue these movements off season, not just during on season election cycles. Um, we need to promote local elections just as much we as we promote any federal elections in the presidential election. Um, I think a lot of what happens, and this makes sense because you know federal elections are much bigger and sometimes have larger overarching impacts. Um, organizations that work with voter education um, and voter mobilizations kind of step down and um, reduce their efforts. And I've seen that from organizations that I've even worked at before. Um, and that's because they have less staffing and less people want to get involved. So I think organizations that are working to um, make youth get out get out and go vote we need to continue that throughout all year around and through off cycle seasons and keep educating people and keep telling them about elections that are coming up and get them involved in the civics process which will lead them to go vote but we need to do this all year around not just at a specific time of the year 
Yeah, I completely agree with Saida. And just to add on to that incredible response, I feel like the real impact is generational, that we can rewrite a million policies I feel like what the real generational impacting is in attempting to positively reform people's hearts and minds on matters of injustice and reestablish trust and partnership between the government and the people directly affected by those systems. I think it's always a matter of implementation because we can go into all the systems right now and in, in, within our country and education and like say, okay, we're going to give you these civic education resources. But if you still don't know how to use them, and then these tools are kind of pointless. And so it's a matter of implementation. It's a matter of the teachers and the elected officials officials and the community organizers all understanding like do you understand your position in leadership do you understand the people do you know the people that you're serving and have a relationship with them and if we establish that from 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 now and then for future generations that's all they're going to know and so we have to start off building like a positive um a positive establishment of what it looks like to be civically engaged Excellent. I think we are going to turn now um, to some questions from some Suffolk students who can join us here. And we have, I think, a question for each panelist. Um, there. So our, our first question will be from Shannon. Thank you, Katie. And thank you to all the panelists for this thoughtful discussion. My question is for Saida. So with my own children, when it's time to go vote, we make it a whole family event and bring them with us to the polling location to explain the process of voting, but also to make sure that they know that voting is one of the very important ways to have our voices heard. So like you had mentioned earlier, children should be taught the importance of civic engagement when they're young. So my question is whether your family has done that with you. And if they have, is it something that has helped drive you to be engaged in mobilizing youth voters on and off campus? Thank you so much for that question, Shannon. Um, yeah, I think, so there are a couple of facets to that. Um, my father definitely is the first person that when I turned 18 was like, you need to register to vote, make sure you register to vote before I turned 18 to pre-register and I registered to vote. Um, but, you know, as far as seeing um, how the voting process works and who to vote for, um, you know, my dad's second language is um, English, so he doesn't speak English fully fluently. Um, we're, we immigrated from Bangladesh, so I had to ask, also help him with, you know, who to vote for, teaching him how to look into information. Um, and I think that was one of the main drivers, I would say, is watching my parents struggle to get engaged in the civic conversations um, for me to go get engaged because I I didn't have those tools at home um, to, you know, know where to go, know where to go get involved and know what issues are important. I had to teach them to my parents and it was important for me to teach that to my community, um, not just the Bangladeshi community, but just the wider community of Lynn, Massachusetts and so on. Um, so yeah, I definitely, my parents have given me a big push um, to be engaged because they weren't really able to vote in Bangladesh. So it was really important for them to go vote. Um, but that helped me to kind of spread that amongst more people and get more people involved to give them access to the information that they need. Thank you. Excellent, thank you both. And we'll go to Bianca for the next question. Thank you, Katie. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming and speaking today. So my question is for Mia, but I would love to hear any additional thoughts or opinions from the rest of the panel on this topic. So my question is, how do you think youth voter turnout would be affected if we were to drop the voting age to 16? And if you think any obstacles that young adults face while voting would be lessened by um, just dropping the age requirement by a couple years? Yeah, um, thank you for your question, Bianca. Like we said, like it's not a matter of do we have the right, it's a matter of how to exercise that right. So even if we did lower the voting age to 16, people that are 16 still have to know how to vote and and that they can vote like and like just know how to exercise the right or else we're just going to be in the same situation I think if students don't know about civic education then the knowledge and the power that they've gained from their basic education is only limited to what they've been told and now they can't actually actualize that and envision it um so lowering the voting age to 16 would be great because especially for this generation because we're just so engaged and we're, we're so like we're we're yearning for knowledge and for um and we're yearning for that partnership with our civic leaders so I do think that it would be um I don't 
exactly see i think it might lessen um the voting barriers because i think at that time then civic leaders would ha would be in a position where they have to um exactly do some civic education reform just because now there's more people that are, have the power to vote and more accessible and so i think they're going to start getting a concern um and start knowing that listen like we we have their eyes on we have our eyes on them and that we're understanding that civically engaged communities doesn't just look like voting but being empowered to go beyond the ballots and take heed of your local officials and i think because youth are so direct um lowering the voting age would actually give elected officials a wake-up call into to, listen, you can't just sit here and not actually engage with me. You have to tell me, you have to um, have a relationship with the communities and let me know what's going on and what you have a plan and idea for our communities and so that we can be um, in partnership and actually form that vision ourselves. Definitely, thank you. Did anyone else wanna weigh in on that one as well before we jump to the next question? I wanted to just quickly jump in and say, totally agree with Mia and I also think it is, I, I think that it should be lower to 16. And I think that a great benefit of that is when youth are in high school and they're able to vote, civic in, like civic education can be bigger. There is a much larger case of, you know, to getting students out to vote, requiring them to go get registered for class or, um, you know, giving them time off to go vote. Uh, I think it would make things so much easier if they were able to vote at 16 because they would have more time to get educated and have more power from a younger age. Yeah, just to quickly echo, I, I completely agree with um, what the rest of the panelists have said so far. I, there is, in fact, in some municipalities across the United States, um, voting age has been reduced to 16. And what we have seen is that, you know, young people have showed up um, and they've showed out informed and actively engaged with the process and um, looking for commitments from their government. And I think as we consider that from a national perspective, we should treat those, you know, different municipalities as case studies um, to see if they have had successes in terms of policies passed that, um, you know, work on work for and on behalf of youth. Um, so I would love to see it again, youth as young as 16 are seeing their rights being stripped away before our very eyes. So why shouldn't they um, be able to exercise their rights? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add that, um, first of all, I agree, voting age should be lowered and um, more young people should be empowered. But while we're waiting for that to happen, there's still a lot we can do with younger, non, not eligible to vote yet folks. Um, and that has to do with sort of the, what's in the water in our country? What's the, what's the culture around voting? And we know from lots of research, just as an example, that political discussions beget activism and activism, of course, begets voting. But we also need to do a lot, I think, in the area of inclusion, a self sense of belonging, a sense of social cohesion that gives people a, a, a real drive to stay involved in their communities and to make a difference through voting, through volunteerism, through all through dialogues that lead to action and social change and community uh, organizing and activism. All of those things are very important and can be done right now. We don't have to wait for the laws to change. And the more we, we give young people responsibility, the more they will step up for it, up for it. And then as they do that, it will make a lot of sense to lower the voting age. Excellent. Thanks everyone for weighing in on that one. And for our third question, we'll go to Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for dedicating your time and your energy to this. I think it's a really important topic. Um, my question is for Milo. As someone who is active in Generation Citizen, I'm sure you've seen how important education is in our society and everyday life, really. Um, what role do you think education should play in our movement of voter activism and youth engagement? A great question, Lindsay. I think that the strength of our democracy starts in the classrooms um, where students um, learn how to engage with one another, confront history, um, build consensus around issues, learn how to disagree and, um, you know, just learn the issues around them for the first time outside of their home, um, kind of on their own terms. Um, but we also have seen that, you know, civics education is under coordinated assault right now. 
um, in that in over 30 states, there have been hundreds of bills restricting what history and civics education can be taught in the classroom. And it's compounding a larger crisis in civics education and that lower income underserved students are less proficient in civics, are less trusting of their government officials and are less likely to therefore participate in the political process. So at Generation Citizen, we're working with historically disadvantaged um, communities and school districts to get them to really engage in the political process um, and learn for the first time that their voice matters um, through practicing democracy in and outside of the classroom. Um, so one of the first parts of our curriculum at Generation Citizen is like building a consensus around an issue to advocate for. Um, and then it's one of the first time that these kids are really practicing democracy for themselves, right? Agreeing around issues and disagreeing um, and finally kind of coming together around a specific issue to champion um, and, you know, pursue uh, legislative outcomes for um, so, yeah, I think education is critically important. I think it needs to be protected. Um, we've seen a steady divestment from civics education um, since kind of the Cold War when we prioritized STEM education. Not that I don't think we should move away from that, but I think we really should be reprioritizing how important civics education and education, public education in general, is to, you know, cultivating active, informed and engaged citizens. Excellent. And then we'll go to Mark for our final student question before we uh, turn to some audience Q&A. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, for, uh, all of you, for having me be here. Uh, my question is directed to Nancy. Um, and I was wondering what results, if any, has your time directing, directing democracy in higher education shown for voter education and retention of politically marginalized students across the U.S.? Well, it's, it's such a good question, Mark. Thanks for asking it. Um, we see pretty big gaps, actually. We One of the things I'm very fond of saying is I don't care all that much about voting. I, I care a whole lot about closing equity gaps in voting. And um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of campuses. We have 1,200 campuses in our study. And we don't have a lot of campuses that have successfully closed those gaps. We know from our data, for example, that Asian American students vote at lower rates than other groups. Interestingly, Black women are the highest voters on a college campus. So sometimes closing gaps means keeping up with the Black women, which is really exciting to think about. But for the most part, when we get students coming into college, we do see these gaps. Wealth gaps are huge. Affluent students vote at significantly higher rates than those that are not. So it, it will take a concerted effort, a real targeted effort to identify these gaps and then work to, to close them. Um, one of the gaps that we report on in our reports to campuses has to do with gaps in um, field of study. And that's been interesting because it used to be that STEM students voted at very, very low rates compared to the social sciences. And on some campuses, those gaps are closing. So, yeah, I, you know, that little sign on the bottom of a, of a subway that says, mind the gap. We all need to be minding the gap. Excellent. Thank you to the students for your really thoughtful questions. Um, and as I look at the questions we have submitted in our Q&A window here, I think there's one that kind of presents a, a natural transition from what Nancy was just talking about. So maybe I'll, I'll see, Nancy, if you have any thoughts on this one as well. But of course, anyone can jump in here. The question as asked is, there are more undergraduate students seeking to pursue law and get involved in politics than ever before. How do you think that is going to impact the scene of politics and civic engagement? Well, I think it will impact it positively as long as the gaps are closed among those who pursue those fields. So if the fields are still predominantly affluent or white students, then it's not, it's not gonna, it's gonna perpetuate the status quo or, or even make it worse. So I think that there needs to be some changes in higher education structurally to make those opportunities 
uh, available to all students, particularly in open access institutions, community colleges, state colleges and universities, what we might call a low resourced institution. You know, they right now, some of those are very good at um, promoting uh, trades or or really good, solid careers. But somehow we have to figure out that there is a relationship between those good, solid careers and en engagement in democracy. So it's not an either or. It's a both and. And we need to start embedding the lessons of citizenship, of democracy, of of collaboration and community and community engagement, community problem solving. I think that the some of the language that used to be thrown around around World War II was that we need to be educating uh, our citizens to have the the skills to engage in matters of public affairs. They need to know how to run public affairs. Everybody needs to do that from um, those who are uh, educated in the trades to those who pursue academic careers and everybody in between. And I'm curious from our other panelists, have you seen this as well? Do you see more students seeking to pursue law and get involved in politics? Yes, and I think it's actually a testament to how much we need civic education in schools because students are searching for it. They're basically saying this interest is saying, like, if you're not going to provide it to me, I'll provide it for myself. And I think it's very it's that's great that we have that interest. But at the same time, it can also be misleading in a sense, because it shouldn't only be students that are going into law that understand how civics works. There should be a basic a level of civic education and civic knowledge for every student in America. And then when you go into that field, if you want to learn how policy making and get more into the complexities of it, you know, then that would be your specific interest. But I think right now, youth are just interested in how does government work. And so that interest is going up because we have more issues. Um, we have issues that we're, we're realizing that we have to face and that we have to address um, when we step into these positions of leadership. And we want to be equipped for that. And so I think we, what we should take from that statistic is wait, youth are going to do this themselves. Like, it's, there's no stopping them. There's no barriers. They're, they're going to work around it. They're going to find out how to get the access to the resources and learn how to use them themselves. So it's a, it should be like, a, it should be a motivation to say, okay, you know what? They're just going to do it anyway. Might as well just help them move along and make the road faster. And so it goes back to that intergenerational relationship that we discuss. I would love to also jump in as a political science student. Obviously, yes, definitely. I see a lot of um, people who are more interested in politics and in law. Um, but and I think that is uh, that is changing the fabric of how everything works. And an example would be so I work for Archipelago Strategies Group, which is a multicultural marketing company. And we have a lot of more government agencies and private institutions coming to us to translate their um, information and resources into different languages. Um, and to outreach to communities of color, like we will hire people from the communities um, and we have them outreach in those specific languages with those with the literature in their languages to be able to have help centers in the language that they speak and to see people who look like them outreach to them to gain that trust and I think more private institutions are hopefully moving towards that, but more need to move towards that and move towards creating that equity in the communities, whatever resources they're having, whatever research they're doing needs to be in different languages by people in the community and for the people in the community, specifically highlighting people of color and people from marginalized backgrounds. We shouldn't just send someone you know, into a community to fix a problem. We should get the community together to create a solution for that problem. So I think that we are seeing that change and I'm seeing my peers getting out there more and more, but I agree with Mia that this needs to be something that is across all majors, all interests, all trades, not just political science and law students. Excellent, and we have a, another question. This one is for any of the panelists. So whoever wants to field it first, feel free. This is, how do you suggest Oops, my screen just moved away on me. How do you suggest youth develop their civic strategies to see effective success and results? Well, um, I'll make this answer brief, and I would say start by joining an organization. Um, that is the best thing that you can do. A lot of these organizations have already set down um, a kind of 
they've already set down a, like a curriculum for themselves of how to a, a, assess civic engagement within youth. Um, I know for me and Wyva, we have something called a civic skills matrix. And so we kind of just reflect on our civic knowledge and our civic skills every once in a while. But there's so many youth organizations out there that are ready and, and prepared to equip you and to mentor you and provide you with how to use these tools and resources. So if you really want to assess your civic skills and where you are within your civic engagement, find a program and that's really specific to whatever your needs are, um, whatever your interests are. If you're interested in criminal justice and you're also interested in civics, there's probably a program for that. Or if you're interested in multiple things and you're interested in civics, there's a program for that. Like there's so many resources that we need to lay hold of. And I think we're also working on that within our organization now with creating a digital civic hub so that people are aware of these resources and it's more accessible to them. Um, so yeah, I would just say start by going in community and getting that mentorship and using those resources that other programs have. To briefly build off that great point, Mia, I think I think young people, they need to, keyword here is develop. I, I think it's commitment to lifelong learning about what's happening around you, the political processes that we're surrounded by, um, and not simply seeing voting as the end all be all of political participation. Um, I think getting, building off that point, it's practicing democracy in our everyday lives, whether it's intergenerational dialogues with, you know, a cab driver, or it's, um, you know, attending a civic society, going, joining a club, um, you know, attending a community event. Um, I think, I think both, you know, learning and then participating beyond the ballot box are two ways that youth can hone their civic skills and really grow as uh, participatory citizens. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question we have here, and if folks who are watching have a question, we can probably squeeze another one or two in. So feel free to drop that in. It's a great group of people to uh, to pose your queries to. So this one asks, what are your thoughts on how civic engagement has changed and evolved? What do you believe is the best way to connect with younger generations? So two parts to that. If you want to field one or both, um, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I think that civic engagement has definitely evolved. And I can see that in like the short couple of years that I've been involved in civic engagement. I think when I was trying to get involved, I really had to seek out resources and, you know, talk to a lot of people be like, how can I get involved in this? I really care about this issue, but where do I go? I have no idea. But I think it's a lot more accessible now, especially with social media, especially with technology. Organizations are doing a great job giving access to young people um, the resources that they need to get involved in their community. So I think that has evolved to that extent. Um, the way to connect with youth, um, and Mia said this, I said this, Milo said this, Nancy said this, everyone said this, give them an issue they care about. Give them an issue they care about and say, this is how you can create the change. This is where you can show up to. This is the protest you can come to. This is the petition you can sign. And this is who you can talk to. Give them actionable items. I love having these conversations and I love you know, talking through these problems, but we need to get out and take action. We need to actually do something after we have this conversation. So I think that's the way to engage, give people something to do, and they will, people will show up, youth will, you know, make that difference, but they need the resource and they need that actionable item. Incredible response. I think you're so right, Seda, that now more than ever, there's just a myriad of issues Right. It seems like climate change, gun violence, like homelessness, ev everything now is heightened. Um, and we saw these issues exacerbated by the pandemic. So I would echo that exact point is pick an issue um, and, and run with it. See how far it can take you. Um, and you'll be surprised by um, where it leads you. And just to quickly add on to what um, both of my peers said, I think it's also just about meeting young people where they're at, um, understanding that, listen, they don't they don't come with all the knowledge, but they come with all the interest. And that's all we really need to go about change um, and understanding where where you can find us. Like we're in social media and we're in school. That is the main two platform for Generation Z. And so if you want to reach us, um, reach, so, reach us through social media and reach us through our schools and make sure you're at like just 
a, a, once again, like established partnership um, and really just speak with youth and find out like where you can work with them, like what, what's their interest at and what, where do they need to grow? Um, I think what we really need to do as like an older generation and as we begin to pass on this knowledge to the younger generation is be able to carefully identify, okay, wait, this young person, not even just like these group of young people, this young person within themselves has carries a unique trait and quality that can contribute to the overall conversation of civics. And so it's really just about being able to identify where can this person grow that they don't even understand that they have the potential to grow. That's excellent. And we have a, a question from within our very own panel. Um, Nancy has posed a question in our chat to her counterparts. And rather than me just reading your words aloud, Nancy, would you like to pose your own question? Sure. Um, so this is a this is something that I get stumped over. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, this is an intergenerational problem. People hate politics. They hate conflict. They hate any kind of confrontation. And they think politics is the ultimate ugly confrontation. What do we say? What do we, how do we get, how do we, how do we help people overcome that hurdle in ways that are authentic? Because I got to tell you, sometimes I kind of agree. No, it's extremely understandable, especially within like our social media generation and cancel culture being such a real thing that nobody really wants to discuss in politics, but we all work our way around it. And I think it's just like there's not really any nice way to say it or like and like you just have to be bold about it. Like you have to be bold in your stance and in your values and your beliefs and understand that, listen, it's not always going to come to agreement. But I think what's so amazing about Generation Z is that not only are we reshaping democracy, but we're reshaping the way that we have conversations around democracy. And so we're establishing and we're illustrating civil civic discourse. Like I, I'm not even going to go into the debates that I've seen between the elected officials that have just been like immature and childish and not really just about the issue within itself. Um, young people are about their issues and they're about the communities that they serve, which is why they're willing to go the lengths for what for what they believe in. Um, so I think it's just a matter of having the right motives and understanding that once you're in once once you're completely devoted to seeking justice for a specific community, there's no links that any any political polarization can stop you um, to seeking that justice. And so it's just a matter of understanding where is your um where are your morals actually rooted in? Because I think what we see in our politics today is that it's more around the conversation of, oh, am I being right? Am I right? Am I wrong? Am I am I popular or am I not? Like, who do I have the votes? It's, it's just a matter of just like logistics of everything. And it's not really about, OK, but is this person being served justice? Is there equity in this situation? Um, and so just kind of getting past the complexities of it and going back to the heart of the issue. Um, I totally agree, um, Mia and, and Nancy. Yes, 100%. Sometimes I feel it because, yeah, it's difficult to have these conversations. Um, but I think a great way to start is in the classroom is um, teaching young people the skills to have a civil discourse. It is a skill. You know, you you immediately want to react with your emotions if you care about something. How do we hold that back? How do we... Um, make sure that we're giving the other person that we're debating with the room, you know, to really talk about their opinion, really listen to where those opinions come from. And I think this needs to start again young, but in classrooms, like have contentious debates, don't avoid, you know, topics that are difficult to talk about and give your students room to actually speak on them no matter what side they're on and teach civil discourse because again it is really a skill that needs to be developed and a lot of students and a lot of young people are just never taught how to properly have a conversation about something that's difficult. Great advice. Milo is that part of GC's agenda? Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, it really is the intractable problem with politics today is how do we bridge the, the divide? It feels so contentious, so hateful, um, so vicious. Um, and I think Sita said it perfectly in Generation Citizen, we're working to really foster democratic practices within the classroom, right? So that's developing communication skills, collaborative learning, um, learning how to disagree and agree, um, applying critical thinking skills to, you know, media and developing media literacy skills and really like 
training young people how to be a member of a community, um, how to be a member of a polity um, before they step into it, before they're just thrown into the wild without really any knowledge of what's going on. Um, so I think fostering an active citizenship within schools is a, is a huge way to, to um, solve this issue. Yeah, and I would just briefly add to that too, that it's a matter of listening, that when like when people do share um, their positions and their views on a topic, it's because of their own experiences that they've had and the things and the things that they poured it, that have been poured into them that have shaped their values. Um, so we have to understand, like rather than I think with the culture that we have today, like like we said, like it's very polarized, very vicious. Um, it's a lot of the times it's just like attack and ask questions later. Um, and it's to really just be like ha having that comprehension skills um, like Milo and, and Saida were stating, just like creating those skills to understand um, that, listen, we need to understand, we need to kind of gain a comprehension around where this person's mindset is at and how and what experiences have shaped their beliefs. And then we can actually understand that regardless of any political belief or regardless of any um, values that you may have, that we can still love and respect each other as human beings. And like when that conversation ends, the issue is still at hand and there's still things that need to be addressed. But as, as two human beings who have different issues on something, you still have respect for each other. And I think there's a total lack of respect and a total lack of grace within our government, which is why it seems like it's so hard to come to, to with an entry point, um, because you feel like if I say the wrong thing, I'm, auto, I'm automatically going to be dismissed from the conversation when it should be like, there is no wrong thing to say. You're just saying what you know and based off of your experiences. Nancy, do you think that conversations like like this one that you've all had today can uh, can play a role in kind of pushing back against some of that toxicity and that off putting dynamic of politics? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I trust the wisdom here in this group. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. I think we're um, we're winding down here. I don't know if there's a if anyone's got a, a final thought or a takeaway they would like to share. We've covered a lot of ground today and I think given a, a lot of good insight into into what engagement looks like, right, for this this new generation and for really everyone more broadly. And I would like to to thank all of you for your insights today and for giving uh, giving us all a lot of things to think about, both in the election cycle and off. Um, and that said, um, Christina, I think I'll uh, let you take it away. I get the last word. That's 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 nice. I don't often get the last word in a lot of different places. You guys were fabulous. This was absolutely a model of uh, civil discussion. I couldn't agree with Saida more about listening and from the nods that I saw in the room, everyone has done that. My tip, I guess, to avoid the toxicity of the word politics is not to use it. I talk about policy. Right? That's something we can we can understand. And I appreciate all of the work that you guys have been doing and here's more power to you. So thank you. So have a great afternoon, everyone. And thank you for attending our class. Thank you.